I, uh, I first came to the city when I was 17 uh, in the mid 90s. Uh, and I came from very far away. I came from a little town in the south of the US, about as far imaginatively from New York City as it was possible to be. And, or, or so I thought. And um, the city for me was an immense, uh, it was like the opening of a great door through which I might step into any number of possible lives uh, that might have seemed impossible where I was coming from. It was a very liberating um, kind of experience. And I tried and failed to get to New York after college, and um, shortly thereafter came a day in, in 2001, I was 22 years old, and I watched the city um, come very close to it felt to me very close to being wiped off the map, which is not a new experience for Europeans, but is a new experience for Americans. And, uh, and after that, I began obsessively, you know, going to the city, because I, I lived through these attacks in Washington, D.C., and I, I was going up to the city to see my friends and make contact with this place that had meant so much to me. And I think I was thinking a lot about what exactly would have been lost if this place had, had ceased to exist. And I came to feel that it was something very close to what would be lost if life ceased to exist. And one day in the summer of 2003, I was on a bus going up to look at apartments in New York because my then girlfriend, now wife, and I were getting ready to move. And it was the same bus I used to take as a teenager, the bus to freedom and the bus to home. And I looked out the window and there was the, the altered skyline. And it seemed to me disordered and voiceless and hovering between possible futures. And on my iPod, this song came on that I'd never heard before, which is about this time period in the middle of the 1970s when the city was also very close to ruin and also when many, many things were possible. And as I listened to this song, I, I knew this time period from a million different sources, especially from, the, from punk rock, from Patti Smith, from The Velvet Underground, uh, but also from The Muppets Take Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just had this moment where I thought, Everything that need everything that's burningly urgent to me, everything I've been witnessing and trying to put a name to wants to express itself through this story of then a kind of summoning up from the depths of what everything that makes the city magical and terrible and everything that would be unconscionable to lose. And uh, and then I thought wait a minute, that's a book. And then I thought, that's the book. And then I thought, oh shit, it's 900 pages long. Uh, and, you know, and I had characters and I had images and I had all this stuff about this book, you know, by the time the song finished playing. And my response was to spend four years <laughs> writing other things and, and essentially hiding from this book that I thought wanted to swallow my life. Draußen auf der Straße warfen sie ihre leeren Kaffeebecher in einen, in einen überfüllten Mülleimer. Charlie war nicht geschickt genug, um zu verhindern, dass ein demütigender Haufen aus Limonadenflaschen und Zeitungen und Styroporessensbehältern um seine Haschpapis herum aufschlug. Doch Sam lachte wieder nur. Und es war nicht die Art von Lachen, die irgendetwas schmälerte. Es war eine warme Brise, die ihn abheben ließ. Dann legte Sam ihre Finger um Charlies Schulterblätter und steuerte ihn zurück durch die Tür des Plattenladens. Die Kasse stand auf einem Podest im hinteren Teil des Raums. Auch der bärenhafte Verkäufer schien Sam zu kennen, denn er nickte ihr von dort oben zu. Charlie schlenderte zum B hinüber und fing an, durch Bar, B, B, Bo zu blättern. Die Bowie-Auswahl war beeindruckend, zumindest im Vergleich mit dem kleinen Stand im Einkaufszentrum, den er gewohnt war. 
Es gab eine Suffragette City Single aus farbigem Vinyl und eine teure Live-Aufnahme mit einem Aufkleber, auf dem Importware stand. Er wollte sie sich genauer ansehen, doch als er Sam kommen sah, steckte er die Platte zurück und griff wahllos nach einem anderen Fach. George Benson? Wie geht? Was? Nein, ich hab nur Quatsch gemacht. Gut, hier ist deine erste Aufgabe, falls du Lust hast mitzumachen. Sie reicht ihm eine Single. Neben der Kasse stand ein Plattenspieler, auf dem man eine Schallplatte anhören konnte, bevor man sie kaufte. Sam setzte Charlie den Kopfhörer auf, eine seltsame, intime Geste, positionierte die Nadel auf der B-Seite und beobachtete sein Gesicht, während er zuhörte. Zuerst dachte er, mit dem Kopfhörer stimmte etwas nicht. Die Musik war ein weit entfernter Sturm aus hektischem Schlagzeug und Gitarren. Doch als die Instrumente zueinander fanden und der Gesang einsetzte, verstand er, dass dies der Stil war. Amateurhaft, lärmend, aggressiv. Es war Wut, die bis zum Siedepunkt aufgekocht war. Und dann wurde daraus eine Art von Freude. Genau das Gefühl, das Charlie an diesem Morgen empfunden hatte, als er aus der Praxis des Doktors gestürmt war. Als er aufsah, bewegte sich Sams Mund. Er nahm den Kopfhörer ab. Was? Toll, oder? Es ist toll, aber ich habe kein Geld. Ich kaufe sie für dich. Das kann ich nicht zulassen. Natürlich kannst du. Ich schulde dir eh was. Wofür? Du hast gesagt, du hast ein Auto, richtig? Du fährst mich nach Hause. Mercer felt divided as to how long he might stay in New York. You know what? Forget that. I'll read, I'll read this paragraph. <laughs> so Mercer's gotten on the bus. He's been on this bus for hour for like two days with very eccentric seatmates. And now this like athletic young white kid gets on the bus and sits down next to Mercer. Riding toward the coast. They exchanged not a single word. Then they crested the ridge of Weehawken, and there it was, New York City, thrust from the dull miles of water like a clutch of steely lilies. As they rumbled down past billboards toward the great churn of the tunnel entrance, the seatmate's arm sort of flopped against his own on the armrest, so that they were barely, just barely, touching the brown and the beige plane of contact, one atom wide, and the huge opposed feelings inside Mercer swelled until he thought he might burst right here, a firework on the heights of New Jersey, never to reach his destination. But 15 minutes later, watching the driver unload his typewriter in the oily gloom of the bus station sub-basement, Mercer would be squeezing the moment back into some inner oubliette. The kid had made off with his rackets, never to be seen again. The Mercer would ever after equate the Manhattan skyline with the smell of English leather cologne. He ascended through brutalist atriums and Byzantine stairways, his arms feeling yanked from their sockets, his eyes that special brand of bus ride dry. Mostly, though, New York was the people. He'd never seen so many as confronted him that morning. Before him on the sidewalk, at head height, were too many other heads to count, moving up and down with the bodies they were attached to, like ripe fruit bobbing in a barrel. Fat faces, thin faces, pink faces, brown faces, bearded and naked, hatted and bald, male and female and everything in between. <laughs> Dazed unto stillness, his heart doing calisthenics in his chest, he was an obstruction an abstraction. The masses could have trampled him had they so desired. Instead, they broke around him at the last possible second, jostling him bodily, perhaps, but leaving the essential Mercer Goodman untouched. Not to put too fine a point on it, but who the hell in this bustling city even cared who the essential Mercer Goodman was? It was this, as much as anything, that made him feel he'd stepped into a dream. Thank you.